All right. Good evening, everybody. We are excited about uh, you being with us tonight. And we're always excited when we get together as speakers, leaders, elders, preachers. And we're glad tonight to have uh, Patty Conwell back with us. She's been here before and she's moving into an exciting direction tonight. She'll be doing a presentation that she'll, um, uh, it's just a fantastic uh, presentation on developing uh, a great speech. I want to remind you that this uh, webinar is sponsored by the Elders of Excellence Fellowship, and we want to just say we appreciate those elders who have made these webinars the last two months free and available to everyone. And I know that you've been blessed by them at the end of this month. We're going to move into an exclusive direction. The webinars will be geared exclusively to those of you who are subscribing to the Elders of Excellence Fellowship. So you got a couple of weeks left. Next week, we have Gamar, uh, Gamar Alexander and Keith Morris coming, and they'll be talking about some principles of homiletics. But tonight, I want to get right into our presentation. How you doing, Patty? You better, un you better unmute your mic. I have to unmute myself so you can hear me say I'm great. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me now? How are things going for you? Things are going well. You know, this pandemic stuff and staying home is right down my alley. So I'm not serious? doing anything really different except I got my husband here too. So <laughs> but we've had to work. We've been able to work that out good. So it's it's all good. You know, your husband said that he's gonna he's gonna teach me how to golf. He's gonna teach me how to golf. So if, gonna... if if you are a teachable. <laughs> Willing to learn student, people have you golfing. Well, that might that might be the the clincher right there. <laughs> He's going out to get some practice on Thursday. <laughs> I gotta I gotta do it. I've been talking about golfing for as a matter of fact, I had a member in um Kansas Avenue in Riverside. This brother paid for me to take lessons because uh -oh. he just knew that I would uh -oh. love it. And I never took those lessons. He was so mad at me. <laughs> Uh, that's why, did you hear me say, if you're a teachable, willing <laughs> student? <laughs> uh, but Sherry, I've, I've got to golf with Sherry. That's another yes, activity do. with my wife. Yes, you do. So I've, I've made a commitment to do. But let me get out of your way. Let's talk about some principles for effective uh, speeches. It's Absolutely. Your time. Good evening, everybody. Glad to be back here with you. When we were together last time, I did a presentation on the 10 surefire ways to be a boring speaker or not. We actually looked at the art of public speaking, but tonight we're gonna to go backwards and share some secrets on how you can create an effective speech. The first slide that you see here is just a little bit about me. So um, you can be sure that I know just a tad bit of what I'm talking about. Um, but we're going to jump right in, as Dr. Jesse has said, and we're going to learn the 10 secrets to a successful speech. And this is part one of two. At the end, we'll share a little bit about what uh, the second part is going to be. But let's jump right in, because you can't be a good speaker if you don't have a good speech. Right. So let's see what that requires. And so we'll start right here with secret number one. You have to choose your topic. And actually, when you are choosing a topic, you want to think about what interests you. Sometimes you may be given a topic to speak on, but even then, you want to go with uh, the topic area that you're passionate about, that you have some interest in, that you stay current in with information as information comes out, because it's hard to put together a good speech if you don't really care anything about what you're talking about. True. So it's important to really have an interest in your topic. And here's a little elementary type diagram. Um, I know all you all are grown adults. You may not need this, but some people might. This is kind of a brainstorming diagram to help you really hone in on the very specific topic area that you want to create a speech around. So in the middle there, you see your general topic, You've got four squares around that that are specific topic areas from that general topic. And then the outer circles are the different talking points for each specific area. So let me show you what that actually looks like in practice. 
So I'm going to talk about books. Um, I like books. I love to read. I'm a writer. So books is my general topic. And you see that right in the middle. Then in the squares around it are different specific topic areas about books. I could speak about different types of books. I could speak about notable book authors. I could speak about how to publish a book. And I can speak about how to write a book, right? And right. then you see on the outer circles, the different speaking points or talking points that I could talk about in a speech. So if I'm doing a speech about different types of books, their biographies, novels, inspirational, spiritual books, horror books, textbooks. If I'm talking about authors, Maya Angelou, Mark Twain, Ellen White, Alice Walker, T.D. Jakes, those are all different well-known authors that, that we know. If I'm going to talk about how to publish a book, I could talk about traditional publishing where you have to get an agent, choose a publisher, or I could talk about self-publishing, how you choose a publishing company how you choose the right publishing package, whether you want to do an ebook or a hard print. Lastly, I could talk about how to write a book, how you come up with the idea and the purpose and the audience and your main points and your outline and your chapters and editing it. And so since I have done that, written a few books, I'm going to kind of base the rest of this uh, talk on how to write a book. That's going to be my specific topic area. So you've narrowed, you've narrowed uh, now from the general um, subject to yes. uh, something that's a little bit more specific. You know, it's interesting to me, and we've talked about this, the similarities in the process that you use to develop an effective speech, at least to narrow uh, the subject matter for an effective speech and what uh, Keith Morris and Gamal are doing when they're talking more about homiletics and the whole process of narrowing, narrowing a theme for, uh, for a sermon. And I'm sure, as we've said before, Jesse, it's like they're first cousins. Yeah, absolutely. There's going to be quite a few of uh, the activities that are pretty much the same thing. So definitely. And so, yes, I've narrowed my topic, my general topic from books to my specific topic on how to write a book. And so your first step then is to choose your topic. All right, our second step is to decide your purpose. What do you wanna accomplish with your speech? And when we, uh, in the last um, webinar that I did, we talked about uh, three different purposes that you generally have when you're making a speech. You either want to inform, or you want to persuade, or you want to entertain. And along with informing, you also might want to educate, okay? And so these are the general purposes of a speech. You're generally gonna do one of these three, okay? Um, now, but you've got to, in everything, bring it down to something more specific, all right? So if I'm gonna do a speech on how to write a book, if I'm doing an informative speech on how to write a book, my specific purpose is to explain the steps of turning an idea into a book, mm -hmm. right? If I wanted to persuade you, then my specific purpose might be to convince listeners that anyone can write a book, mm -hmm. okay? Um, entertain, that's not really going to be my general purpose for this particular speech. And so you see how you go from, just like we went from a general topic to a right. specific topic, Right. You want to go from a general purpose to a specific purpose. What is it that you want your speech to accomplish? When people leave the room after you've spoken, what do you want to happen? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's generally the question that you're going to answer. All right. So that is step number two. Hey, Patty, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. In this whole process of um, creating an effective speech, are you going to determine before the process begins or as the process um, proceeds or after the length of the actual speech? When, at what point do you determine how long? Well, generally speaking, just like you told me I have an hour, the person who is asking you to speak can tell you how long that speech should be. Uh -huh. And then the number of main points, and we'll get to that in a minute, the number mm -hmm. of main points that you have can help you 
make sure that that speech falls into that timeline, right. as will the practice that you will do before you actually get up and speak. That's good. So, um, so, but yeah, you're the one. Whoever's inviting you to do the speech is the person that will tell you how much time you have. You know, I'm going to bring it up to Gamal and uh, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> you're not telling them their time or are they not paying attention? <laughs> we, hey, I will not be incriminated. We're going to talk about time. <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I'm going to stay out of that one. And I'm going to try to stick to my, my 60 minutes. You're going to stay in your lane. Huh? <laughs> I'm going to stay in my lane. <laughs> All right. So we've got our topic, how to write a book. I've got my purpose that I'm going to explain. Uh, three steps in turning an idea into a book. And now I'm at step number three, which is to create your thesis. Jesse, what is a thesis? A thesis? <laughs> Steve Ruff just jumped in. That's cold, baby. <laughs> um, I guess a thesis, and it kind of depends on your genre. If you are uh, asking me what a thesis would be, my thesis, the thesis would be the primary statement that runs through my presentation. Absolutely. See how it great, is. see how I am? I'm a preacher. Just wake me up at midnight. You see what I'm saying? Just, just winging it on the fly. <laughs> um, but you're right. The thesis is keyword statement right? Uh -huh. It is a specific, concise statement that summarizes your whole speech. Mm -hmm. So when a person, when the listener hears your thesis statement, first of all, you're supposed to be able to even pick it out. Mm -hmm. If I'm listening, I should be able to say, oh, that's the thesis, right. right? But the listener should be able to hear the thesis and know specifically what you're going to talk about, right? And people find it difficult to get that thesis, that summary, into one single statement. Yeah. But yeah, that's so important because it really focuses you on what you want to talk about and helps you to not go off on tangents. Uh-huh. Right? So getting that thesis into a single statement is very important. All right. So here's a, a little uh, example of a weak thesis statement and a strong thesis statement, okay? Mm -hmm. um, remember, my specific topic is how to write a book. Right. So here's a thesis statement. Writing a book is easy if you know what to do. Why would I consider that a weak statement? Well, first, what does easy mean? Easy yeah. means different things to different people. Mm -hmm. it, it's too broad of a term, right? Uh, writing a book is easy. It might be, my easy is different because I've done it a few times versus someone else who's never done it. Right. So it would not necessarily be easy, okay? Right. Right. Um, this statement I consider weak because it's not really specific. If you mm -hmm. know what to do, what does that mean? You know, so can you really understand what I'm about to tell you about versus the strong statement, in three steps, you can turn an idea into a literary work from the heart. Now, what do you know I'm going to speak about? Well, I'm going to speak about three steps that will help you turn an idea into a book coming from your heart. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit more specific than the first thesis statement. And so that's an example of how you really want to try to get um, specific with your thesis statement. So just question. Mm -hmm. Some people, um, are, some people are crazy about the steps, the keys, the threes, the, I mean, as a rule, do you think that the thesis statement should be a little bit more organic to the material? Or do you see value in saying three steps or four keys of those types? Is it generally helpful for you? Or is it just a preference? Um, I think it, it, for experienced speakers, it kind of boils down to a preference. Uh -huh. <laughs> experienced mm -hmm. speakers is the key. Mm -hmm. Okay. For people just who, at the beginning level, um, I think that it's easier to keep track of what specifically you want to talk about if you can quantify it by three, four, you know, it, it really helps to, to keep you honed in 
on what you what it is you're trying to do. It probably um, markets well too. I, I don't know. I mean, for some some people don't like it at all. Right. When you go to any bookstore and you're looking at titles. Those threes and those keys and those numbers just seem to be the order of the day, you know? Well, you know, it also helps a person who's going to listen kind of know <laughs> that this is not going to be never ending. <laughs> when I get to a one, two, three, I'm done. Yeah, Ten, remind me, that, that's another point I'm going to bring up on uh, next week. Good. <laughs> thank you. There we it's, go. It's, it's a good go. marker, right? It's, it's part of the signpost that we need as listeners that this has an ending. Right. So that's that's another reason why that right. helps. OK. Um, all right. So we've got our specific topic. We've got our specific purpose. We've got our thesis statement. Step number four is to form your main points. Let me say this before you. Uh go to number four, Patty. I want to remind those who are on, again, we say this every week, this is a Zoom webinar. It's not a Zoom meeting. And so you're not able to audibly um, submit your questions, but we have a student assistant here who is checking the Q&A uh, field and the chat feature. And so if you have any questions at all that uh, come to mind as Patty is moving forward, um, then just put it in the chat feature. I see Tabitha says she loves lists. I love lists too. She's so making an observation. But um, if you have any questions or any comments, uh, just uh, engage us through the chat feature or the Q&A. Patty, the time is yours. All right. So step number four is to form your main points. You've often heard, or you may, may not, but it's often... Um, it, it's common for when you're doing a speech to start with the body, okay? Mm -hmm. And so your main points, again, we're talking about keeping you focused. So we wanna start with your main points. And generally speaking, a, you know, a speech is gonna have, let's say a 20 minute speech might have about four to five main points that you then have to support with additional sub points, right? Um, and so you don't want to have too many. Uh -huh. And these main points kind of come out of the subtopics that you want to key in on in your speech. All right. So my speech is how to write a book. And so here are three main points that I came up with. Right. My first main point is about what happens before you actually start writing. Before you write, determine the purpose, its target audience, and create your outline of key points. That's the first thing that I would talk about in my speech. Mm -hmm. The second point I would talk about is the writing process, where you add stories and details to each key point in your outline. Then the third point I would talk about is what happens after you write. After you finish writing, ask a trained editor to edit your manuscript. Hmm. All right? So those are my three key points, my three main points that my speech then will be built around. Okay, so come up with your main points because that begins to lead you in um, another step that's a couple, couple steps down the way. All right? right, so we got our main points here and now we're going to talk about creating your outline. Those of us who are really into organization love outlines. Tabitha says she loves lists. I love lists. I like outlines, again, because it keeps me on track. You know, when you're thinking about writing a book, and say if you're writing a book about something in your life, um, some experience you had, um, there's so many things you could talk about. How do you narrow it down to the very salient, specific, um, essential ideas that you need to share? Because there's typically so much to share. Right. And so outlining is very necessary. I still do it after, you know, teaching and writing for over 20 years. I still outline. I've, I'm sitting here with the outline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm not even talking without a little outline, okay? Um, so there are three outlines, three types of speech outlines that you can do. The first is a prep outline. This is the outline that you put together as you're brainstorming. You've come up with your specific topic. You brainstormed your main points. Now, 
in this outline, is, it probably can be handwritten, okay? This, this is what's going to lead the research that you have to do, all right? So your prep outline, probably handwritten. You're just putting down main points. You're putting down brainstorming what you could talk about. Remember my diagram with all the circles and the, the talking points that I had for right. each specific right. area. So all of that now is going in your prep outline because that outline is going to be what leads the research that you have to do in preparing your speech. So that's going to be the very first outline that you put together. All right. The other two I'm going to speak about, even though you would not do that at this point, and that's the full sentence or formal outline, which is your final outline after you've done all your research um, and you put that outline together. It's full sentences. Everything is in full declarative sentences. All right. That's the formal outline. Then you have your speaking outline, which takes the formal outline and then abbreviates everything into just little fragments that can prompt you to talk about what you should be talking about. It keeps you on track with where you are in your speech and it allows you to add those nonverbal cues that you might need to prompt you to look at the audience, to smile, to gesture, right. all right. of those things that you might not be used to doing if you're not an experienced speaker. Let, and let I have a, uh -huh. let, me, let me ask you this, Patty. We, we talked about this a little bit last week. When you did your, um, when you got your main points, mm -hmm. and you mentioned that the main points are helpful in, um, narrowing the amount of things that you try to cover and keeping you from chasing rabbits. When you get to your, no, when you get to your prep period, you have your main points. How are you determining uh, of the things that you could use to develop the points that you've already determined when you kind of going off on a tangent or if it's just, just developmental material that you might have to throw out at some point? I'm just trying to figure out as a matter of process, are you narrowing as you go or, what are you using to say, ah, no, nah, that's not on point? You know what I mean? Well, first, when you're brainstorming, you don't, you don't put, you know, a box around brainstorming, right? Uh -huh. you, just, you, you just let it flow. Right. And in your prep outline, you can let it flow, mm -hmm. right? Because, again, that's going to lead your research. Now, mm -hmm. often, when you begin doing research, you may discover that you can't find a lot of research on one main point that you have there. That's a good point. You may That's find too much research on another point. So mm -hmm. that point might be a little bit too broad. You might be able to divide that into two separate points, right? Mm -hmm. So the, mm -hmm. the prep outline kind of serves as a brainstorming outline. I love it. As you begin to research, that will also help you narrow things down. As you look over your prep outline and the supporting points, you may see, oh, you know what? I can group these points or supporting points into one area sub subtopic i can group these into another subtopic so i don't have to talk about them necessarily individually i can talk about them under a subtopic so that whole process begins to help you narrow things down especially if you're a beginner mm -hmm. okay so let your research lead you and let me say that even if you're an expert in what you're talking about, expert meaning really you've got experience and all of that, right? right? Maybe you, you've trained in it, that's your, your, your professional area, you still need other outside research, even Good if stuff. it's one or two things, mm -hmm. okay? And mm -hmm. we will talk about that when we get to the research in the next step. Yeah. So the prep outline can help you narrow your main points and, and supporting points to keep you focused. All right, so prep outline is first. Your full sentence outline is when your research is done and you're doing your final outline and your speaking outline is what you do before you get ready to actually make the speech. Okay, so let me, let me, let me jump in again and, and where we had our disagreement last week. We don't- All right, it. all right, come at so, me with so it's, I don't know if it's a difference in, in, in genres, but literally you've moved from your preparation outline to your sentence outline, and then you're taking an outline up to you to do your speech. And you were saying last week that 
you wouldn't take a full speech or manuscript up. Right. And it's interesting. I'm just, I, 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 get, I, I want your opinion. Some of the most <laughs> effective preachers are literally manuscript preachers. I don't know. Um, oh, it's no question about it. They, they are definitely um, out of the manuscript at different points, and they know the manuscript well, or not, well enough not to really uh, preach from it if they don't have to. But um, so, but, so see, but, but, but you've, already, you've already supported the extemporaneous style of speaking. Uh -huh. You said that don't don't throw they, my stuff back at you, me you you said that they know the manuscript right they don't really have to take it up there with them that might be somewhat of an overstatement but yeah yeah you know the <laughs> the, the precision of language for instance i was using um this week i was listening well he's not a good example there's certain there's certain ministers who probably don't need to take up a manuscript. But that manuscript is a tool and an instrument that not only, I guess, helps them um, with the precision of language, but it also kind of sends a signal to the audience of the importance of language. I, I don't want to overstate it, but you see what I'm saying? I don't, yeah, I don't know. But, but you're talking about it as though a speaking outline would not be serve as the same kind of tool. I got you. I got you. Mm -hmm. that, I got that's you. the point of a speaking outline. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about extemporaneous speaking, which is what we teach when we teach speech, mm -hmm. it's a blend of memory, some reading, but it, it, it gives enough latitude for you to not be scripted. Because now you know mm -hmm. the best preachers are the ones who they're, they're talking right to you oh, yeah. they're talking oh, yeah. with you they're, oh, yeah. they're speaking in language that you can relate to they're absolutely you know, that's those are the great those are the preachers that i love sure, right sure. and so mm -hmm. in speaking it's no different a preacher who's up there reading everything uh how long are they gonna have your attention yeah hey, uh, well hey and and you know i just, just I, I wouldn't i don't want to put too fine a point on it because the best manuscript preachers these days and some manuscript the younger generation seems to be more enamored with manuscript preaching it's interesting but having said that it's because of those different dynamics that you mentioned they know the stuff right and the manuscript sometimes is just a point of familiarity between them and the congregation that might be used to a manuscript it's a whole nother dynamic but i'm always interested in like you said, the first cousin conversations between <laughs> speech development and homiletics. But anyway. Right, right. All right, so um, outlining technique. Typically, you're using an alphanumeric, you know, the Roman numeral, one, two, three is your main points. Then it goes down to the capital A, capital B. Then it goes down to the one, two, three, and the lowercase ABC. So it's the same type of thing. You're doing using an alphanumeric system. You're uh, outlining in a descending order of importance, right? Um, and so that's that's a common way of outlining uh, a speech. Then you've got, as we said, the formal outline, which you're using full sentences, and your speaking outline, which you're using fragments, sentence fragments, and nonverbal cues. So I'm going to show you examples of the two of those as we move forward. So that's our outline, okay? And that's important to, first of all, helping you do effective research. And as I said, even if you are <laughs> an expert, mm. you've got to do research. Yeah. And you generally are going to do research in two areas. Remember last time we talked about knowing your audience, that it's important that you know who it is you're speaking to. Oh, this is good. Um, and so when you're preparing that speech, you also want to know what do they know about your topic? Yeah. If I'm speaking to a room full of people who have all published books, then maybe I don't need to talk about how to write a book, uh -huh. or how to publish a book, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unless I've got some just hot off the press, you know, new fangled idea, technique that nobody knows about. But I don't know if you don't know about it unless I know what you know. Uh -huh. right? So I have to find out what you know about the topic. 
and I need to find out what your attitude is about the topic. Now, often, just like with the time frame, you should be able to get some of this information from the person who's inviting you to speak. They should be able to tell you how much your audience knows, what the mix of audience is, yeah. like you did yeah. me. Yeah. Um, and because you don't really have uh, the ability to do a survey of these people. So yeah. you have to use some shortcuts, but the, the main thing is ask. <laughs> you know what? Let me, let me do this. That, that's, that, that's, a, that's a good um, opportunity for, I, I'm curious. And this is for those who are looking at the webinar. I'm curious, and you can put this on the chat feature, who is a preacher uh, by profession and non-preacher? You can just put that in the chat feature I'm, because uh, you've mentioned a couple of times the need for us to understand how much time we've been given. Of course, that's going to be a totally different dynamic when we determine our own time. But I'm just curious, and uh, if you could do that, for those of you all who are looking right in the chat feature, just put the word preacher or, uh, uh, or uh, non-preacher, and I would know what, and this, this goes to your, your full-time uh, vocation. Go ahead, Pat. Okay, so audience research is important, no matter how uh, little information you can get, it's still helpful. Then the other side is, of course, doing research on your content. Mm -hmm. Again, people feel that you are uh, even more credible when you support your points with other people who are credible, right? Um, and so the depth and breadth of the research of your support is important. You want to have enough that people know that you did some homework. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and yeah. it needs to have enough substance that people know that you did your homework. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Um, and so that becomes important. Now, credibility with the age of the internet, and Shelly White has raised her hand. Yeah, um, she's going to have to, Shelly's going to have to submit that question in the chat feature. That, I'm glad she did. Yes. Um, we can recognize the raised hands, but again, we're taking the questions via the chat feature and uh, we want to get you guys engaged. So any questions you have, uh, put it in the chat feature or the Q and A field. Go ahead, Pat. All right. So credibility becomes really important in the age of digital information, the internet, the web. Yeah. There are so many opinion makers, bloggers. You know, uh, I just, you know, have an interest in this and I'm going to talk about it, but I really have no expertise. I'm not a professional in it. You got to be really careful when you're using information from the internet to make sure that your sources are credible. Mm -hmm. Now in school, and Jesse knows this, when students are doing papers, we, we never allowed any dot-com sources mm -hmm. because... Oh, that's dot com over. covers any and everybody. Yeah. It was either dot gov or dot org or dot edu. Uh, the only time I would allow dot com sources is if it came through library databases like Eric or other databases that have kind of been vetted for you know making sure that the sources are credible. Right. Um, coming from journals or coming from magazines, coming from newspapers. So. It's the standard really has the, the standard has been considerably relaxed. Okay. Considerably <laughs> relaxed, and I, I'm yeah. I'm curious, um, your uh, opinion or definition of a credible source. Um, traditional, well-known yeah. uh, media. Yeah. Uh, Wall Street Journal, New yeah. York Times. Mm -hmm. You know, even yeah. Ebony Magazine. Or, I mm -hmm. mean, media, and, and even if you. Uh, um, online media that's coming through professionals as in you know that they're you know they're doctors or they're they're from a university they're professors who've done research yeah so your professional journals um your industry uh journals and and periodicals so anything gotcha. like that gotcha. uh, is generally considered credible sources Okay, so that becomes really important. And, and again, if you're an expert in what you're talking about, you don't need a lot per se. But again, you want people to know that this is not just all your personal opinion. 
Yeah, we're at the, um, just the notes, everybody who's watching, this, this is fantastic. And uh, I'm trying to stay out of the way, but I'm learning so much every week. <laughs> we're at the midway point, actually it's 7.35, and we are done at the top of the hour. We try to incorporate, incorporate questions as we go. Just want to remind you that if you're not a part of the Elders of Excellence Fellowship, uh, Christian, my student assistant, is going to put up the uh, in the chat feature the link to get you to the registration uh, field. And so we want you to be a part of the Elders of Excellence Fellowship. Got plenty of stuff like this, three, sometimes four webinars a month, Adventist Church at the Crossroads Conference. We just got a lot of good stuff. We want to help you sharpen your tools and your skills. And uh, so register if you're not a member of the Elders of Excellence Fellowship. Register today. Go ahead, Patty. All right, so the last um, slide in this area of research is making sure that you attribute uh, information to your sources, whether spoken or whether at the end of your, you know, in your, in your paper. But proper source attribution is very important. So yeah. you want to have a few quotes that you're using from people. And when you do that, there's a, 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 a weak way to attribute uh, information to your source and a strong way. So here are examples. The weak way says, author Mike Fishbein says that blah, 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 blah. Well, my first question as a listener is, well, who's he? Right. Okay. Um, you know, how do I know he's an author? For you to just tell me he's an author, okay. You know, but the stronger way to say it is, in his book, How to Write a Book in 10 Days, Mike right. Fishbein says, so I put him in some context. I let you know that he's written a book. And if you want to pull it up and see for yourself, you can. Right. right? right. So that gives him more credibility. Right. Um, so, and then you see, again, a, a lot of students might, uh, in, in a speech, refer to a research study or a research that was done. Well, what was yeah. it? And who did it? And, yeah. you know, and so when you're attributing information to your source, just make sure that you're giving enough information that you don't leave your listener wondering, why should I listen to that person? What, what makes them credible? Yeah, those weak source attributions, that's the order to date. That, I mean, that's the president. That's, 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 that's Trump's <laughs> oh, approach. So-and-so oh. said, a study yes. said, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Yes. Anyway, I digress. I can't yes. help it. Go you ahead. Digress and vote. Go out to vote. vote. It's your fault. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's move on to step number seven. You talked about, Jesse, the importance of language, and it is very important. You must use effective words when you are putting a speech together. And what do I mean by effective words? They need to be simple. Uh -huh. Depending on your audience, you don't want to use jargon. You don't want to use slang because jargon is specific to people who actually know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So if I'm talking in, in, within my industry of educators or public relations, which is my area of specialty, I can use jargon with an audience who knows what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But if it's a, a, a mass audience, then that would, that would confuse people and and really lengthen my speech because I have to explain, right? I have to explain what I'm talking about. Yeah, there's a, there's another uh, raised hand. I see someone yes, else I raising a hand. I just want to remind you, use the chat feature or the Q&A feature. You know, to your point, Patty, that, that point of uh, jargon is even more of an issue when you are um, doing online speeches and presentations because you don't know who's out there. Right. And when you begin to use jargon, that uh, it, it can really alienate people who might be out there in that big, vast audience who don't have a clue what you're talking about. Absolutely. And then the same with slang. Slang is different in different, the same word means different things in different regions and different cultures and different. So you want to stay away from that. So you want to use simple language that everyone can understand. And then you want the language to be concrete. What do I mean by concrete? it means that it has the same meaning for everybody. So for instance, a non-concrete word would be love. Love means different things to different people. Mm -hmm. We think we are all talking about the same thing when we say the word love, but we're really not. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you want your language, your words to be concrete, have the same meaning to everybody. Mm -hmm. And usually that means you have to use specific terms. Okay. Um, but simple, then descriptive. What do I mean by descriptive? You want your words to promote visual images and emotions to the person who's listening. Mm -hmm. Remember that as a listener, I can't go back and rewind you like I can do the DVR. Right. I can't go back and reread you like I can do in a printed, you know, magazine or newspaper. Mm -hmm. I've got to get it the first time. That makes language very, very important. Right. So make sure that you're choosing simple words, concrete words and descriptive words. It's always better to explain than to define. Mm -hmm. Because that way people can really process what you're saying. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We're at number eight and I think I'm doing good on time here. Yes, I am. Number let me eight. Get, let me uh, let me ask this question. It's coming from a uh, preacher, a uh, friend of mine, Steve Ruff. As a matter of fact, um, Hi, Steve. yeah, Steve. Steve I, let me tell you something. Steve is a preacher. Oh, and, I know that. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting the number of preachers who are not only looking at the homiletics presentation that's done at the end of the month, but like me, going through the principles of developing a speech. Because the principles are basically the same, okay. but I get, in some ways, this helps kind of get under the hood in ways that a homiletics class doesn't. But his question was, uh, we talked about non-concrete words. What about an example of a concrete word? Okay, that's good. A concrete word would be, hmm. A concrete word could be, an armchair right versus chair right an armchair pretty much means the same thing to everybody mm -hmm. right um another concrete word would be um instead of love if i said agape love mm -hmm. would that mean the same thing to everybody mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. agape love is a very specific type of love. Mm -hmm. so Concrete that, words have a tendency to be more visual. In other words, when you hear the word, you see the word. Right. The, uh, those words are a little bit more nebulous. I mean, some people can catch it. Some people won't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just helping you. You know, I'm just here to help. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, really. I do, because I, you know, even though I have my little outline here, I might not hit all the points I need to hit. And so I have no problem with that. Okay, thanks, Steve, for the question. All right, so number eight, step number eight, we're at writing the body. Remember that we want to write the body first, okay? Mm -hmm. And so here is our full sentence outline. And I wish I could blow it up for you. Yeah. Um, but I've got my title, I've got my thesis statement there. In three steps, you can turn an idea into a literary work from the heart. And then you see in the body, I've got three, my three points. My first main point. That's good. Talk about before you start writing, determine yeah. the purpose. My supporting point says the purpose answers the question, what do I want my book to accomplish for a reader? All right, yeah. under that, do I want to influence or do I want to move to action? Mm -hmm. My second set point for what you do before you write, no specific characters of your reader because mm -hmm. it helps you target and sharpen the book's message. Mm -hmm. And under that, I talk about my demographic profile and then I talk about my psychographic profile. Right. Demographic, demographic helps you know who the reader is, age, educational level. The psychographic helps you know what the reader thinks, beliefs, attitudes, opinions, behaviors they currently display. And then my last sub point under that one is the outline, the key message and supporting points that detail the key message. You I know, you can't, you can't expand that, but they can. Uh, I think they had the capacity to expand. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, so what's the key message? And then what should be your, so how you write your supporting points. So that's this is good. everything under before you even begin writing the process. 
Mm -hmm. Then I have what's called a transition. What is a transition? The transition is the little bridging statement that moves you from one main point to another main point. All right. So in this case, I might say, now that you know why you're writing, what you're writing, and for whom you're writing, it's time to add the meat. So you're, that, you're, that's, that would be a literal transition. You're not given, uh, you, this is, well, let me put it this way. In your speech, mm -hmm. you literally write out your transition statements. I got you. And why? Mm -hmm. Because again, remember, we're listening, right? right. I, I got to get everything the first time. So I need to know where you are in uh -huh. your speech. I have finished my first point. Now I'm getting ready to move you to my second point because I want you to keep stay up with me. Uh -huh. right? And transitions also include what we call signposts. Signposts are words that let words like first, blah, 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 second, blah, 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 mm -hmm. or, you know, to begin, blah, blah, blah. Next comes blah, blah, blah. Those are signposts. And when you think about it, you can understand how those words can serve as little posts of where I, where I am in the speech. Where, right? where, where's the signpost? Because I can't see this. This thing is small. Well, no, this, it's not in here necessarily. Well, go, hit that again. I like that signpost thing. The signpost is another type of transition. Okay. So the signposts are words or phrases that let you know where you are in the speech. Okay. First step is, right? So I said- You see Steve, Ruff, Steve, Steve Ruff's laughing at me. I'm trying to help him. I'm trying to help him. It is, oh, <laughs> oh, you're helping issues. him. Huh? <laughs> so you're helping <laughs> him. I'm, I'm asking these questions to help the masses. I'm, the, the masses I'm concerned about. <laughs> oh, go ahead. All right. So, um, and so, yes. Yeah, so you've got your main points, a transition, then my second main point, add stories and details to each key point in your outline. I talk about where you can get stories from. I talk, they can come from personal experiences or experience of others. They can come from uh, current events, things that are happening in society around you. And then the details come from explaining how those stories reflect the supporting points of your key message and, mm -hmm. and kind of ties it all together, mm -hmm. right? All right, then I would have another transition because when I wrap up my second main point and move you to my third main point, and I don't didn't put all of that there because I'm just giving you kind of an example. I got so you. I wrote out the first main point and all the supporting points I would have. And I my research, I would have a quote in there somewhere or whatever to support that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's my that's the body of my speech. That's that outline. I can see why you didn't really push for a manuscript because that outline is fairly comprehensive. Do you use, um, uh, do, do you, do you indicate, have you ever indicated or would you recommend that a person literally place where they should like emote? Some people would literally yes. put. Okay. So we're getting to that. Okay. okay. I got 10 minutes. No, we're go getting, ahead. That's our speaking outline. And I've got an example. Oh, okay. Got you. Okay. So. Um, and remember, and she's here. back. Every, she's back next week, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> the next week? Oh. <laughs> oh no, not next week. Next no, month. I'm next sorry. Month. Next oh, month. Scare me. I was like, wait a minute. I didn't think we talked about that. Okay. <laughs> so here we are. Step number nine. We've got our body. Now it's time to write the intro and the conclusion. And what elements are involved in that? In your intro, that's where you have to first grab attention, grab the attention of the people listening to you. Give listener relevance, as in, why does this speech matter to the people that you're presenting it to? What do they have to do with it, right? Speaker credibility, which is giving information that helps you understand that you should listen to me. I know a little something about it, all right? Your thesis statement and then your main point uh, preview. And I'm going to show you what that looks like in the, in the next slide. For your conclusion, you've got your thesis restatement. Remember last time I was here, I said that you tell the audience what you're going to tell them, mm -hmm. then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them, mm -hmm. right? That three, that, that, that three repetition thing, right. you know, we're talking about in our lesson study about repetition. So that works across the board, right? So your thesis restatement, 
your main point summary, which is reminding them of what your main points were, and then your clincher. You're going to close it with a bang. Yeah. Okay? You don't want to peter out and leave your audience feeling like you didn't wrap it, wrap it up. Yeah, we call it a hoop. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. <laughs> you want to have a clincher. Okay. Oh, we're going to have a clincher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but here's your speaking outline we were talking about. And now I have some of the introduction in there and some of the conclusion. Okay. So my attention could be, remember, I'm talking about how to write a book, right? And I'm giving you the three steps that help you turn an idea into a book. Right. My attention getters could be something like self-published books cracked 1 million sold or published in 2017. Mm -hmm. Now, that's just a fragment of what I would say. You see there, I have memorized. Mm -hmm. I would memorize my whole attention getter, right? So you want to grab attention with some kind of crazy fact or some huge number or some, some quote that just really, you know, sets the stage. That's what you want to do to grab attention. It can be a question to the audience as well, right? Um, relevance. Each one has a story, life lessons, help right. others. In other words, you, if you're listening, we all have a story that we could write a book about, whether it's our entire lives or some facet of our life journey. We have life lessons that we've learned that can help other people. And that's what would make it relevant to the person I'm presenting this particular speech to. Mm -hmm. Credibility is that I've ghostwritten four books. I've authored two of my own. I've done numerous articles for Message Magazine. Though, so that gives me credibility if I'm going to tell you how to write a book. I should know what I'm talking about. Um, then my thesis, which we, we've already said a couple of times in that preview, I'm going to tell you what you do before you write. I'm going to tell you what, what you do in the writing process and then what you do after you write. Those are my three main points, right? Mm. Okay. Then you got that transition from your intro to the first main point. The first step in the writing process builds the foundation of your book or the structure of your book. Okay. Then you go into the body, right? Now, look after sub point number one. And you see here, everything is now abbreviated into words and phrases. Mm -hmm. sentence fragments but look i have next to number one to do a gesture because i'm asking you. Mm -hmm. what do you want your book to accomplish yeah so i'm reminding myself do mm -hmm. some kind of gesture that goes along with what i'm saying mm -hmm. a little bit down under two i say look audience left i want to make sure that i look over to the left i want to make sure that i look over to the right so there are your cues that you were talking about your nonverbal cues at yeah. the transition between uh, the first point and the second point, I have smile. <laughs> you know, you got to remember, you got to look pleasant. You got to look like you enjoy what you're talking about, mm -hmm. right? So those are the kind of things that are different in your speaking outline. And this is why I said that other outline you said, wow, I can see why you wouldn't need a manuscript because that's pretty involved. But here I'm using the same kind of tool. Yeah. But I don't need to spell out everything that I'm going to say word for word. Yeah, I'd, I take, I'd, I'd still take the other one in. Go ahead. I want to sound organic. I want to sound... Yeah, 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 yeah. I'd still take the other one. Yeah, yeah, okay. And if you're a great actor, preacher experience like you are, Jesse, then you... Yeah, thank you, thank the you. Manuscript and it Flattery will get you everywhere. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, so that's um our speaking outline. So now you've seen... What the prep outline, well, you, I told you what the prep outline looks like. You've seen what the full sentence outline looks like. You see what the speaking outline looks like. Mm -hmm. All right, and now we're at our last step. And that is to create supporting materials. We talked about last time in our webinar how uh, visual supporting materials help to uh, people to retain information much better than if you didn't have any, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but how you use them is very important. So you can have visuals. We talked about PowerPoints is very, you know, um, people like to use that. And you know, Jesse, that's my pet peeve that most yeah. people use it incorrectly. 
Yeah. Um, they put all their text on it. They read from it. That is not the way to use it. How to mm -hmm. use it is how you've seen me use it here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That's true. Um, That's true. You know, pictures and, you know, just a small amount of text. Um, so like your prompts. Audience, you use them more like prompts. Exactly. Yeah. Like, exactly. Um, you can use uh, props. You can use um, uh, demonstrations. You can use um, like, um, what do they call when you have, oh, models, you know, depending on what it is. But you want to have some type of uh, supporting material. It can be mm -hmm. audio. It can be handouts. Okay. But the key is whatever you use needs to be large enough for people to easily see. And you got to consider how big the room is yeah. that you're walking in. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Your type has to be large enough. Your pictures have to be large enough, okay? That it's easily seen by everybody in your room, all right? So consider the tool that you're using for your visuals. Is it a projector? Is it a poster board? Is it a prop? Make sure that it's large enough for people to see and know what it is. Make sure it's clear, mm -hmm. meaning it's not distorted. I can't stand seeing pictures on a PowerPoint where they tried to make it big, but it, it, it went out of the scale mm -hmm. and people look longer than they're supposed to. Or, you know, you can tell that it's a distorted picture or the lighting is bad. It's yeah. too dark or yeah. it's too, too light. OK, mm -hmm. you want you want your things to be clear. You want your things to be crisp. OK, uh, if you're using handouts, make sure that the copies don't have lines on them because the ink smeared or because there was something on the glass or Good make stuff. sure they're clean copies. Okay. You want them to be crisp. Mm -hmm. Simple means less is more, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to PowerPoint. People want to put all kinds of bells and whistles in the PowerPoint just because they're available. Okay. But you don't want your stuff to look busy. <clears throat> you don't want to have a people sometimes are scared of, dead space or white space or negative space, which is the space where nothing is, right? Right. Don't be scared of that. Right. The, the more space you can have, the cleaner it looks, the easier it is to follow. So you want to keep it simple. Keep it consistent. Repetitive elements. If you looked at this PowerPoint, I'm using the same colors pretty much. The way the, 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 uh, the, um, the art looks is similar. I'm using the same typeface. I'm using the same point, uh, typeface mm -hmm. point, point size, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? You want to make sure that it's consistent because that helps to promote visual cohesion and helps it to not be distracting, which is the last thing. You don't mm -hmm. want any of your supporting materials to distract from your speech because your speech is the most important thing. It's good stuff. And there is the end. Here are my presentation sources. Um, and there you go. Hey, this was great. Um, I've got a number of people who are asking about the um, outline. Yes. I didn't speak. To you. Say it again. I, yes. The, what do they want to know? Do we have a time to answer any of those? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we're closing up. You're coming back next month. Incidentally, next month is going to be uh, moving on from this as a foundation getting into specialty speeches, introductions, toasts, roasts, acceptance speeches. Um, the majority of you who are looking at us tonight are not full-time preachers, and we have that in mind for this presentation from month to month. Next week, you'll want to listen to Gamal Alexander, Pastor Gamal Alexander, and Pastor Keith Morris from uh, the Kansas Avenue Church. Keith is and uh, Compton church in California, Gamal is, they're going to be talking more to homiletics, the development of sermons. But this has really been cast to non-preachers, though preachers are obviously benefiting from it. Let me just mention that uh, this month is the last month of our special. Just a few more days from now, you have to be a member of the Elders of Excellence to continue to get these presentations. We've made sure that the um, Subscription is just nothing. And as a matter of fact, we've made it clear that if you can't afford that, I don't know if it's $9 or $14 or whatever it is, if you don't have it, just let us know. We don't want anybody not to be able to get this material if because of the pandemic you don't have the resources. We want to get this 
material out. But at the end of this month, uh, we're going to be addressing specifically those who are subscribers to the Elders of Excellence Fellowship. Now, to those of you all who've been asking about the outline, that's what they want to know, Patty. Can they get a copy of the outline? Well, I, I can send you a copy of the PowerPoint. Yeah. You can send it out yeah. to everybody else and make it available. That's what I meant. I meant the yeah. PowerPoint. Definitely. Well, good news, everybody. What we'll be doing tonight in about an hour They'll edit the beginning of this uh, night's broad uh, uh, webinar. And so we will be sending a um, copy of this recording to you. And for those of you all who request the outline, I should say the PowerPoint, we will be doing the same thing. Let me show you something. We wanted to give a gift to those of you all who are becoming members of the Elders of Excellence Fellowship. And so you can see this thing. I feel like an infomercial. <laughs> An infomercial. Wait, this you is gotta a, do a little bit better. Um, it is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the new African American hymnal, and we're getting a free copy of that to those who subscribe. Patty, I appreciate it. The information has been fan. You are helping me. Great. Although you're still not right about that manuscript thing, you That's got growth. Right. You got a growing disagree area. Disagree. Disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I have well, no problem with that. <laughs> we want everybody to know that Patty will be back next month. And we'll expect you to be with us next month. So let me pray with everybody. Father, tonight we thank you for the time that you've given us to understand principles of communication. We want to be able to communicate effectively to men, women, boys, and girls as we try to expand your kingdom. Now bless us tonight. Thank you for Patty in this presentation is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.